Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We have an amazing guest on tap right now, uh, someone that has lived kind of a unicorn of a life, uh, going from Gambino, wise guy, uh, pulling multi-million dollar heists around the country, running with the Gotti crew out of Queens, uh, goes to prison and does a complete 180, turns himself into not just an author, but you know, a historian, an intellectual, uh, has been out of prison now, going on 20 years, I think, and uh, has done a lot to uh, make a mark. And he's, he's doing speaking engagements, he's writing books, and he's going to come and shed a lot of insight and history for us. Luis Ferrante, thank you for joining the OG pod. Hey, Scott, thanks for having me on your show. So just, you know, let's just, you know, dive right in and just, you know, tell us about uh, your beginnings and uh, how you hooked up with the Gambinos, how you started doing those, uh, you know, big time, high profile heists that, you know, are made for hopefully one day we'll, uh, we'll have a movie and a, maybe a television series, letting everyone know uh, how that all went down. But t- tell us how you got there. Um, started out as a car thief, ran a chop shop in my neighborhood. The auto body collision shops in my neighborhood were happy to buy parts from me as opposed to going direct to the dealers where they would have paid top dollar. Uh, Back in the day, there was a lot of tag jobs floating around my neighborhood. I tagged plenty of my own cars. Um, If I a tag job, just so your listeners who don't know, um, I'd buy a wrecked car with a clean title, not a salvage title. A salvage title meant I would have to go to motor vehicle. They'd have to inspect the car. But if I bought a wrecked car with a clean title... I could basically steal another car, pop the dashboard tag off, pop it into the the new stolen car. If I could, I'd even match the color so I wouldn't have to paint it or wouldn't have to change the color at motor vehicle. And uh, if you got pulled over by a cop for any reason, they usually just check the dashboard VIN number. Um, Back in the day, you just popped out the the windshield and put pop the VIN in. You needed the certain uh, you needed these certain rivets, which we had access to as well. And other than that, I mean, if you got pulled over by Auto crime, it was a different story. They would check more of the serial numbers all over the car and you'd get pinched, but that, that never happened to me. Um, so we did that, uh, ran a chop shop, and then at some point or another, I was in one of the auto body collision shops that I was supplying with parts, and I realized that the toolboxes were worth a lot of money, these giant toolboxes, and the tools were worth a lot of money. And the guy told me this tool truck comes once a week, at least, if not every few days, um, and it's probably got a hundred grand between the toolboxes and the tools on it. And I said, you want one? And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'll take one. You want one? I just need somewhere to drop it off. And that's when I started hijacking trucks. Um, from there, I just kept hijacking trucks because I felt like it was, if you steal a big load, it's a lot of money at one shot. You know, now I've learned the art of patience, but it took me years to withdraw into somebody and years in a prison cell later on before I learned patience. Uh, but I didn't have any patience when I was young. I couldn't steal cars fast enough. I couldn't get the parts to the guys fast enough. And when I started hijacking, I felt like, you know, it didn't take me long to, to, to realize that how many cars I would have to rob to make up for this one load. And I was just doing that in like an hour. So I moved into hijacking. Once I moved into hijacking, I put together a really good crew. There were guys in my neighborhood that were older than me that had done time and stuff two, three years, five years, six years and came out. They were, they were arm robbers. So I kind of like, I felt like I could use these guys in the beginning to put together like something bigger than they were used to doing. And I started doing bigger heists and stuff, bigger hijackings and guys brought me tips and one, you know, you meet a fence on the street, you meet another guy, you meet, and you start to meet wise guys. Um, at some point or another, you meet maybe somebody's, full of shit. Maybe another guy isn't. Maybe one guy's big, another guy isn't so big. You meet a, lo- a load of different t- types of guys and it's really who you end up trusting and liking. That's who you deal with. And then eventually, um, yeah, at some point or another, I found myself smack in the center of you know Ozone Park, Queens. I grew up in Flushing. That's where I was originally from. But my haunts were Middle Village, Maspeth, Woodhaven. I was all over Queens. And, uh, and I ended up in South Ozone Park, Queens. And around the same time, just, you know, I'm, I'm a teenager when John Gotti took over the Gambino family, mm-hmm. shifted the power, essentially, you know, the, the headquarters of the Gambino family from Brooklyn. Yeah. Obviously, Staten Island, Castellano lived in Staten Island, but it was Brooklyn. You know, that was a lot of the uh, old time gangsters who made it big 
moved into Staten Island. They bought houses on Todd Hill or some of the hills overlooking the bridge over there, the Verrazano Bridge. But Brooklyn was where the center of power was. And God, John Gotti moved that to, to Queens. So it was sort of a geographical accident because that's where I'm hijacking trucks. I'm stealing cars. I got a chop shop. And, and now Lou, Lou, isn't the Queen? I mean, tell me. As someone who's not from New York, I've been to New York a thousand mm -hmm. times. Love it. Mm -hmm. Best city in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but would you say it's true uh, for people that maybe aren't from the area that are watching this from other parts mm -hmm. of the world or whatever? Like the way that they talk about Charleston in, in Boston as being like a bank robber capital, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say Queens kind of reputation wise was known as kind of like a hijacking capital? Like yes. a lot and of Queens reason, guys were hijacking. In yeah. Place. Yep. And before I answer that question, it's interesting you said that because when I was in the penitentiary, I was with a lot of guys, uh, Boston Irish from Charlestown that, yeah. that were in for robbing armored cars. And I and I said to them, how many of you guys robbed armored cars? Every one of you. We, we, you know, we walked the yard together. Yeah. And at some point I said to them, why don't they stop, like route the trucks around Charleston? Don't go through your neighborhood. Like, don't go through the place where they're ripping them off. Yeah, I mean, that's where all the, all the trucks are getting heisted. So anyway, I gave them a laugh. But uh, getting back to Queens, yeah, it was a hijacking capital. John Gotti came up the same way I was coming up, hijacking trucks. And the reason being was John F. Kennedy Airport, John F. Kennedy Interna International Airport, originally Idle Weed or Idle Wild. Idle Wild. Yeah, way before my time. But it was JFK as long as I remembered. And uh, that was a hub of traffic for, for goods, merchandise, billions of dollars coming in and out of that airport. So I would constantly get tips of an, on a truck coming out of the airport. Um, now that actually, so I took a, I took trucks on the street regularly and eventually I, we were investigated for and charged with armored car heists as well. I took, I do anything. If you gave me a safe, you told me where the safe was, a vault, whatever I did it. Um, but as far as JFK, at some point when I start getting involved with guys on the street, I realized that a lot of those trucking companies are connected. So you got to be careful which truck is coming out of where when you take it. Uh, you know, you don't piss, you don't want to piss off the wrong guy. And who, you know, it did happen to me actually once when I did take a truck and the guy got twisted. Um, you know, how do you not know this is my company? And I, I really didn't. So, you know, you got to be careful. Can you tell us who that was? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. Right. I, I, yeah, I thought I'd ask. He's actually still alive. Yeah, he's oh, yeah, actually gotcha. still alive. And as I as I understand it, he's still active. He's an old man now. You're just for uh, people. To, I want people to know before we go any further. Lou did not do any cooperation. Lou did his time, kept his mouth shut, didn't give anybody up, mm -hmm. uh, and then just turned his life around. Uh, yeah. There was no. Um, no, no, nothing. No rewards or nothing. Uh, right. Thank so you for pointing that out. That, that's yeah. something that's as crazy as it sounds. That's something very unique um, yeah. in this world, especially uh, on uh, social media and YouTube and people that are writing books. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just want people to yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah thanks, ahead. Scott. I was actually um, just to just to briefly touch on that. Um, I was facing life in prison at one point because we didn't have any murders, me and my crew. We had no bodies that we were tagged with, but. We did have a lot of heists. And if you break down in the feds, when the feds grab you, it was a Hobbs Act, which is like a RICO indictment. Mm -hmm. when, the feds, when the feds Moving, grab, moving uh, uh, stuff across state lines. Right? Interstate, yeah, across interstate, that, interstate yeah. commerce, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and we had a lot of counts on the indictment. So each time there was a crime committed, it held, let's say, a 10-year statute. And each time a gun was used in the commission of a crime, which was every single count, there was an additional five-year statute. I'm not sure if the law has changed since then, but that's how it used to be. So if, for example, you were charged for argument's sake with 10 crimes, which we were, give or take, um, that would be 100 years for the statute uh, alone and another 50 for the guns. So we were facing 150 if we went to trial and blue trial. Now, would you get that? Yes. I was in Brook Metropolitan Detention Center for three years fighting my cases. I had three different cases at the same time. They kept re-indicting me to put pressure on me to snitch. They knew I was in uh, I was in and out of Pete Gotti's house. John Gotti's older brother, Peter, was a captain in the Gambino family. And that eventually became a boss. He was the boss. That's correct. Yeah, he was the boss when John went away. Yeah. And uh, I think he eventually became the official boss yeah. at some point or another. Not and even after. I think yeah. official. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, he, he was the last Gotti uh, leader before the Sicilian faction of the Gambinos kind of uh, took – uh, you know, the, the driver's seat there in the family in around, you know, 2008, 9, 10. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At some point or another. And now Pete died recently. Right. Um, and he was, yeah, he was, a, he was actually in prison, not to go down a rabbit hole. He was actually in prison close to somewhat close to Detroit where, 
were OG Pod and Gangster Reporters yeah. based out of. And I know there were a lot of guys that were uh, locked up with him in Elkton. Yeah. These Detroiters. I have, to, I have Detroiters. to tell you, I read and hear a lot of stuff where they where they kind of like um, they criticize him. They call him dumb, stupid. He was far from dumb or stupid. I mean, I was around him regularly. He was a very smart man. Um, the Gottis overall were sharp. They knew the streets. They understood the streets. They, it was in their blood. It was their life. Um, you know, John, Jeannie, Peter, Richie, Richie, yeah, Vinny, all of those, all of the Gotti brothers. There were other ones who weren't involved, but those Gotti brothers were in the, on the streets since they were kids, practically yeah. since they were born, and their kids too understood the streets because they grew up in it. So if you talk to, for example, like the Ruggiero's, they'd say, oh, I got to go over to Uncle Johnny's house. Mm -hmm. You know, can you drop me off by Uncle Johnny's house? That meant that can I drop him off by John Gotti's house? Um, you know, they called each other uncle, uncles. Um, you know, they're, they're involved and live that life from when they're born. Um, and so Pete, John's brother, Pete, again, they often called him a dummy. He was far from stupid. He was a smart man. He was just reserved. He wasn't an aggressive man. He wasn't ambitious as his brother was. He was more laid back. He started out as a garbage man. He came into the life to help his brother and to be there for him. Uh, but I got to tell you, there was a lot of things where he had to step in for me, help me with something. If there was a beef, uh, sit for me. And he was always, I counted, you know, I thought he was a great guy. You know, I mean, uh, I liked all of the Gottis. Richie Gotti was a gem. Uh, Richie, Richie, the father I knew, but I'm talking about Richie, the son. Uh, John I, feel, I feel bad for Richie from from somebody that is follically challenged. Mm -hmm. All those Gotti's had great hair, and Richie had lost to. his hair at a really yeah. young age. Oh, Richie the brother lost his hair. Richie right, the yeah. last time I saw him. Yeah, 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 Richie the brother. Yeah, Richie, Richie was a cue ball. The the brother, right? Yeah, but um, all those. But John had the greatest head of hair you ever seen. What a head of hair, exactly. <laughs> yeah, what a head of hair, uh, and 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 a great dresser, right? I mean, you know, yeah. this is like something that. Uh, you know, now I like to dress like he did then, you know, I'm older now, but when I was a kid, I, you know, I didn't have any fashion sense. I, you know, I had a few suits that I liked wearing now and then, but nothing like John, John dressed like he, he was right out of gentleman's quarterly. I like to do that. Now I have a whole, you know, walk-in closet full of beautiful suits. But back then, you know, I mean, John stood apart. Even if you, even if you walked into a room, there was a few wise guys from the neighborhood um, the Carrazzo's Jojo Carrazzo used yeah. to dress really nice. I used to see him in nice suits um, you know, but they were old, it was old school guys, you know, they didn't necessarily so old where they wore fedoras, but they were still old where they, they got dressed every day. If you saw them, they were in a suit, Joe Butch Correo always dressed nice. Uh, even if he didn't have a sport jacket or a suit on, he was always dressed with slacks and expensive shirt shoes. You know, these guys were like, they were different. Um, but well, anyway, getting back, but, but yeah. before you jump back in, I just, I want to clarify something from some media reports and I want to mm -hmm. see if mm -hmm. what the media was reporting and what you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, jibe. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been stuff that was written, I believe in the post, uh, but that would refer to you as John Gotti Jr.'s best friend. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, I knew John Gotti Jr. Right, but uh, you wouldn't I, say yeah, you were, would you say you no, were his I, wasn't best his, I wasn't his best friend. I was younger. I was a lot younger than John Gotti yeah. Jr. And when you're younger, the age I, I went away at 25 facing right. the rest of my life in prison at 25. So when I'm 25, John Jr. is maybe, I don't know, 29, 30. Yeah. Uh, and when you're in your early 20s, it's a big difference when there's yeah. years apart. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I stood, I hung out with Pete and Pete's son, Peter. Pete, okay. Um, John Gotti Jr., I went by his club now and then. I saw him. I liked him. Uh, I, As I understand it, he liked me. A friend of mine who did 20-something years, I took care of him throughout that whole bid. Uh, he got out not too long ago. He bumped into John on the other side of, uh, on, on down in South Florida and, uh, John sent his love to me. He said, tell Louis, you know, I said, hello. And uh, I sent it back to my friend. Uh, you know, I mean, he was a good guy. Um, you know, I left the life when I came home. I don't reach out to people. If I bump into them, I talk to them. I have no problems with anybody. It's just that that was, you know, and as I understand it, John Gotti Jr. left the life too. Yep. Like, in terms of like perception, <clears throat> then we'll, go, we'll jump back into what we, uh, before I interrupted you, I apologize. But no. um I think kind of what you said about Peter Gotti, mm -hmm. at least just from watching the 60 Minutes interview that mm -hmm. Junior did uh, 10 years ago or so, mm -hmm. uh, I thought he came off a lot sharper and smarter than his, you know, the perception of him or the reputation of him. Mm -hmm. Some of it, and this kind of gets into the history that I know that you love mm -hmm. to, to chop up and, and do the analysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of what 
you know, some of the the knocks on Junior, I don't even know if it's Junior's fault. I mean, John is making him at 21, making him a capo at 22. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. acting boss at 20. Mm-hmm. It, it seemed mm-hmm. like you were taking somebody – that mm-hmm. that was a really young guy. I don't mm-hmm. care about his lineage, and you were throwing him in the deep, deep end of the pool mm-hmm. at a very, very young age. So if he made some mistakes here or there, leadership, why, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think that should uh, impugn this guy's intelligence. Or no, uh, he's, he, I was he, incredibly impressed by him when I watched that hour. Long. Yeah, he was. So John John Gotti Jr. As I knew him then, and from what I know today at a distance, was sharp. Still is. He's a smart guy. Uh, his father was no dummy either. His right. father was smart. Father mastered the streets. Uh, John Gotti Jr. was in a position, um, like you said, he's, you know, his father brings him into the life. He puts a lot of weight on his shoulders and very quick, you know, very fast. Um, also, too, there was, if John Gotti Jr. did something wrong when he was growing up, uh, let's say he went to a club, beat up five guys or something. In front of people, his father would be throwing chairs, yelling at him. But when he left, you know, everybody left, then, you know, John would smile. <laughs> oh, his son doing right. it right. That, this was right. told to me by Agati, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah for, for quite a few times when this happened. Um, so, you know, he grew up a certain way that, you know, even myself, it's different from my own upbringing. You know, I grew up legitimate. I just became a thief when I was 13, started stealing cars, started hijacking trucks, he grew up in that life. He's born into it. His father's a wise guy from when he's born. As I understand it, though, he didn't really know too much about it until his father became boss. Uh, and you should talk to him. I mean, he'd be great to talk to. I've, I've, ta- I've, I've talked to him, you know, off, uh, uh-huh. any, off, you know, off anything, you know, television or radio or whatever. I, talk, I know a lot of people that are kind of in his inner circle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been kind of going back and forth with him for a few years. I'm hoping to uh, lock him down for an interview one day or maybe do something, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, remote or going to spend some time with him or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I got nothing but respect for the guy. The, the guys that he has that he has around mm-hmm. him right now are real uh, good people that have his best interest in mind right now yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and, and keeping him really diversified and away mm-hmm. from a lot of the stuff he, that he, got him in he trouble. Step, you know, he stepped away. I judge him by the fact that he stood up time and time again, he went to trial time and time again, and he beat them time and time again, the feds. Five times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I know the pressure it is to have three cases on my back. I know the pressure it is, what pressure it is to go to trial. I had William Kunstler represent me. One of the yeah, I was going to, I wanted to ask you about that later. Yeah, Kunstler was an incredible man. So I know what he went through. I have an idea of what he went through. And then he's got the Gotti name. So I had to, they constantly put pressure on me knowing that I was around the Gotti. So I can't imagine what the pressure was like yeah. on him being a Gotti, being John Gotti Jr. So, you know, I mean, and from what I understand, he did his, you know, I don't know what he got into his head one day or didn't, but I judge somebody at the end of the day, what they do. And he never snitched. He never, I, just, I think it's, com- I think it's a comp. I think it's a very complicated layered nuanced issue that mm-hmm. if people want to go down that rabbit hole and debate that it's been going on since, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for the last 20 years or 15 years or however mm-hmm. long since some of that mm-hmm. paperwork came out. I, I, I don't really, I think that's neither here nor there. To me, I like looking at it at kind of what, you know, what you're talking about in terms of historical analysis and yeah. understanding history and how it relates to certain me, very important me, eras. But he, if you yeah. look at, mm-hmm. if you look at kind of like what I was saying about how he had uh, so much weight on his shoulders at a young age, mm-hmm. then you have the situation where you have that tape of him going to see his dad in prison and and trying to explain to his dad how hey if I just take mm-hmm. this deal Can't I'm not gonna, I'm not going to cooperate I just mm-hmm. I want to take this plea mm-hmm. deal mm-hmm. and I can get out from all uh, yeah uh, and and John loses no. his mind yeah well the problem see, the problem all this with that is place on tape just give me an I give you an idea what the problem with that was and I understand where John Senior was coming from and I understand John Junior too but John Senior told. Joe Piney, Joe Gallo, and a million other old time guys. No, you can't no, take please. a play. No, please. We don't plea. If we have to admit that we're part of something, we don't take the play. And how are you now going to allow your son to do that? That's that's where it's almost like when Stalin, right? Stalin, the Russian dictator, mm-hmm. during World War II, they said, if you give us a few generals, the Germans told them, we'll exchange them for your son. He said, How do I do that for my son when I have everybody else's son dying? So, you know, it's it, it you're in a tight spot. 
Everybody said, oh, Sal, Stal Stalin sold out his son. He let his son die. What is he supposed to do? So John Gotti Sr. was in the same boat. Now, John Gotti Jr., to, to, his, uh, to his credit, he's trying to take an honorable plea. The guy won't let him. Now, when I went, I took a plea in one of my cases. So I'll just give you an idea of how I was taught and how I believed. When I went in front of the judge, and you could find this somewhere, you know, there's, there's uh, minutes. I went in front of the judge. The judge read the plea. I read the plea and, and he said, and I, he, when he read the plea, rather, he said, uh, with you did this with your, with your, it was a count, one count on the indictment I copped to so that they would dismiss the other counts in return, in exchange for the plea, not ratting, not snitching on nobody. Mm -hmm. This was a global plea. We were originally offered 20 years, take it or leave it or go to trial. And then eventually I got 13 years. I was copping to because the witness in the witness protection program violated the program and was thrown out. We didn't know that at the time. We just thought, okay, 13 years, I'll take. My co-defendants will get less. It's a, it was, um they wanted it as a global plea. If we all take it, they'll give us the deals. So we took it. I go in front of the judge. The judge goes, you did this particular crime with so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. I said, Your Honor, I won't accept that plea. He said, what are you talking about? I'm reading the count in the indictment. I said, I don't care. I did it myself. And he goes, I don't understand. I go, I did it myself. I will not use someone else's name in my plea. I says, I won't allow that to be used against somebody else in the courtroom. I'm not ratting on nobody. I don't want to do it. Now, I didn't go that detailed. I'm telling you that part. Yeah. I just said to the judge, I won't take that. So the judge says, would it be okay if you said you and your confederates committed this crime? Because there's more than one person that yeah, yeah. did it. I said, that's fine. You could say that. But I'm not giving a name. Name, yeah, yeah. I will not, even if they're named in the indictment with me, I don't care. They're back at the back of the jailhouse with me, these guys. Right, right. And so, you know, I'm not going back saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I mentioned your name in court when I took my plea. We right. all expected each other not to mention each other's names, you know, so they can't come to us with something else later. That was just the way we did it. So I understand where John Sr. was coming from, but I also understand where John Jr. was coming from. We want to take the plea. We don't want to serve life. John Gotti might have told me, no, you're not allowed. We want to take the plea. As long as we take it honorably and we don't give nobody else, leave, uh, leave us alone. It's the same way a lot of times I write books now. I write books. They're all over the world. My last book was an international bestseller in 20 languages. My newest book is a trilogy. It should be going around the world as we speak. Um, the fact that I write books, old time uh, guy, oh, you can't write a book. That's a rat thing to do. I never ratted on nobody. I never would. It's like, what are we going to do? History is different than cooperating. Exactly. There's a there's a delineation there. Totally. And what are we going to pretend the Godfather trilogy never came out? Are we going to yeah. pretend nobody ever went to see Goodfellas? Are we going to pretend nobody watched The Sopranos? Right. Everybody knows what this is about by now. I'm not giving nobody up. I never took the stand against nobody. I never give a name in private or in public. I never get put nobody in jail, and I never would. This ain't the yeah. Keith Offer hearings or the McClellan hearings. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Scott, the shit right. I'm talking about is 30 right. years old. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, when I talk about myself or something I did, it's 30 years old. Nobody I got cares. people that say to me, like, oh, you're practically an FBI agent. I'm no. like, what are you talking yeah. You're a rat. Yeah. Wait, yeah. I didn't take any oath. I'm yeah. a reporter. <laughs> exactly. You're a reporter. You're a journalist. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, now, by the way, too, I'm on the other side of the fence. I stepped to the guys when I was in jail. I went to the underbosses, the bosses, and I said, listen, when I was facing life, I said, if I never leave here or if I got to leave here in a pine box, so be it. I, I signed on for this. Nobody twisted my arm. I make my own decisions. I'm here for my own. Because all the rats always say, well, this guy didn't do this, or that guy didn't send my wife money. This guy should have. Everybody can do, can do the mental gymnastics in their head they and massage, the, so massage yeah. the facts why their cooperation is okay, but nobody oh. else's cooperation. And I'm waiting okay. for somebody to just go, I punked out and I didn't want to do time. Right. Or right. I cried in my pillow until you know I made the deal. Nobody comes forward and says that. So Whatever the case is, um, you know, I mean, you, you get it. I mean, that's like, you know, but basically I told these guys, look, if I ever get out of here and I may never get out of here, I'm facing life. They know I am. If I ever get out of here, I just want to go my own way and be left alone. What are they going to say to me? With all the guys that rat nowadays, no, Louie, you can't do that. <sighs> what are you kidding me? Just don't give us up. We don't care what you do. And that's basically, look, in, in back in November, I was in New York. So I met with a friend of mine. He was with the Lucchese family years ago. He left the life too. He still sees everybody. They all respect him and, and love him. He did over 10 years. He goes, Louie, there's guys that want to see you. Let's go. I said, you know, I'm not in the mood to see everybody. He told me who they were. I go, you know what? I'd love to see them. 
we gave him, I gave them a big hug and a kiss and we kept it moving. Nobody has a problem with me. They know I stood up and they knew he stood up. So that's the bottom line nowadays. Guys are smart enough to know with all the rats that there are out there, guys who don't want to do time and will give up their own mothers. If you got somebody who's willing to stand up and he just says, leave me alone when I'm done, how are you going to say no to the guy? So that's sort of what's changed. And that's how the mafia has adapted, I think, to the current environment. They know if guys, after Sammy went bad, everybody went in, Sammy the Bull went bad and got five years for 19 murders. Everybody went in and said, give me Sammy's deal, Gas Pipe Castle, yeah. Little Al Diarco, Fat Sal Majorta. One after another, they went in and said, look, I killed less people than him. Yep. Give me more, give me less time than him. So he sort he sort of like set a precedent where everybody ran in and tried to get better deals or as good a deal as Sammy did. And everybody thought by the end of that wave of guys that ratted, everybody figured, oh, ratting's fine. What's the difference? It's the difference is, is who you are. I can't look at myself in the mirror. If I grew up with you my whole life, Scott, and we ate in each other's houses, and I know your mother, I know your sister, I know your brother. And all of a sudden now I get jammed up and I go, why go to the pen when you could send a friend? Here, I'll tell you what Scott did. I mean, come on, man. How do you do that? You know, how do you, I'd rather die. I'd rather die in jail. I'd rather somebody put me in front of a firing squad and kill me before I do that to a friend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so here's a dear friend of mine right now. Ronnie G. Alonzo. I grew up with Ronnie. Yeah, I saw some pictures of you. Uh, on, Ronnie G. is uh, Ronnie, Everybody loves Ronnie G. I've everybody. Never, yeah, Every the Bananos, he is like a, a, a favorite the, son, and I've heard a lot of, uh, you know, he's on a trajectory, I hear. The reputation Ronnie has is well-deserved, and I'll tell you why. The kind of guy who would give you the shirt off his back. If you said to Ronnie, if you went to Ronnie and said, look, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to lose my car, my car payments are due. And how much is, how much you owe? I owe twelve hundred. Here's the twelve hundred. When do I owe it to you? Whenever you got it, you know. Or don't worry about it. That's Ronnie G. That's how Ronnie G. was. Anybody too, not just wise guys, not guys involved in life. A gem of a guy. So here's a perfect example. First of all, Ronnie G. Never ratted. No, no, no. Ronnie, and I knew Ronnie G. Is as solid as solid can be. I, and I grew up with him. I knew, I knew they never. Ronnie would never rat. But here's a guy I did things with since I'm young. We hijacked our first trucks together. I'm gonna rat on Ronnie G. How, how would I do that? How would I do that? So the same token, when he goes away, how is he going to do it to his friends? This is who you are. And the rats, that's who they are. And shame on us for not spotting that early. Because all these rats, I got to tell you, they got bad tendencies and little things come out now and then that we should have caught years ago. For example, I mean, John Gotti's really surprised when Sammy the Bull rats everybody out. He's been killing his friends for how many years to take over their businesses and every other crap? And now you're surprised that he's going to kill a few more friends from the witness stand. Why are we surprised? Well, I've all, you know, to you to throw out another example uh, or to, to color up what you just said, I, I think one of the biggest issues there, and I'm not sure when it started, it, it might, it, it, it could be have, or it could have been, or is been going on forever, but I, I've seen it more uh, amplified and kind of, this this almost a phenomenon of, of guys with a lot to lose, you know, big time shot mm -hmm. callers mm -hmm. that bring bring in close to them people that they barely know mm -hmm. as they're middle aged. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in their 40s or 30s mm -hmm. or 50s mm -hmm. and they haven't known this guy since childhood. They just met this guy mm -hmm. and they bring him in closer than they they bring in their brother. And then the next thing you know, well, he's are Guys cooperated on a stand against him five years later, or guys wired up. Again. And I'm just thinking to myself, why would you bring a guy that you don't even know that you haven't known since here's you know, the, the problem the playground in so close? Yeah, well, sometimes, sometimes what the problem is, for example, let's let's go back to John Gotti since well, not not all the time. Let's go back to John Gotti Sr. since we talked about him. Yeah. John Gotti Sr. loses to a heroin case, he loses Johnny Kanig, Jeannie Gotti. Angelo Ruggiero's roped in on that case and then dies of cancer. These are the best friends he's ever had. Yep. Tony Roach goes away. All of the guys around John go away and they're gone. So John's stripped of all the guys that are closest that he could count on with his life. And now he's stuck sort of like with guys who he just met in a sense, maybe knew them, knew them alone. But you guys, when you know somebody like I know Ronnie from when we're kids, mm -hmm. Ronnie's mom, I went, I went one time when I was only going on the lamb once 
I went to Ronnie's house and I, and I knocked on the door. I go, Miss G is Ronnie home. She goes, no, why? What's up? She could tell if something's up with me. I go, I got a, a trunk load of guns. I'm, I got to drop off. I'm going on the lamb. She looked both ways and goes, hurry up, bring them in. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, so I know this family from when I'm, you know, a little kid. I know how Ronnie will react if he's got his back against the wall. This, these are people you know. But let's say Ronnie goes away and now I'm stuck and I need somebody to rely on. Who do I rely on? You got to rely on maybe somebody you met maybe two years ago, four years ago. You heard somebody vouched from. You heard he's a good guy. You know, John didn't grow up with Sammy. No, John I know. That's another, that's another kind of, for people that don't know inside baseball, I remember me when I was kind of st- starting to study this stuff in my 20s. Mm-hmm. I had had this perception from the media and from the narrative that Gotti and Gravano had been like, you know, no, uh, best friends for not years. True. And then when I start reading the, the history, mm-hmm. they're like, no, they actually didn't really know each other that well until right. you know, they started to plan. Right. The, the, so let's, the, the let's go here's a good, here's a good example too. I'm friendly with, uh, I used to stay Chinjiganti. Had a, had yeah. he lived in his mother's house yep. in the village, right? Okay, so he lived in his mother's house, but he had a family in Old Japan. He, he had two families, two the families, family. but the original, the real family. There's right. a, there's an illegitimate family and a legitimate family that bears his name. I don't want to call the other ones illegitimate. I understand. No, I know. I know. Family it's for, been well uh, covered. The we family all, that yeah. bears his name was were dear friends of mine. I used to stay there on the weekends. Rita is one of my dear friends. Rita, oh, I love we sport. love Rita here at the OG Pod. She gave one of the greatest interviews. Oh, it's great! So I love Rita. Rita's my, my close friend for thirty five years. Okay, so her father. Let's use him as an example. Her father comes up. Her father's surrounded by guys he's practically born with in that same area. Uh, Louis Bobby Manor, uh, Benny Eggs, Mangano, uh, his brother Ralph, his brother Mario. Um, one guy after quiet another, Dom. or quiet Dom, Baldy Dom, uh, quiet Dom, Baldy Dom, and and uh, there was a third Dom, Fat Dom, one mm-hmm. of the other Doms. All of these guys he's around since he's almost born, if not born, he fought with them in the ring. Uh, what's his name too? Uh, who just died? The other one, the other Genovese he- heavyweight who just quiet died. Dom just died. He was a quiet Dom just died. Okay, yeah. quiet Dom. He's around these guys since he's a kid. He trusts them with his life. He knows when he's playing a game of Pinochle, everybody at that table, if the feds ran in, are going to serve life if they have to. Now, let's say all those guys were taken away from him. Who's he left with? He's left with strangers. You know, he at some point or another, there's a commission meeting he had with uh, Vic Amuso, Gas Pipe Casso, Sammy the Bull, John. He don't know who these guys are from, from a can of paint. Mm-hmm. How does he know these guys? He knows them because they're stuck at the same round table as he is. So, you know, now he's got to put his trust in all of them. Gas pipe went bad. Sammy went bad. Vic and John, Vic and Musso and John stood up. But 50% of the guys at the table went sour. So, you know, I mean, he's stuck. He can't sit at a table with Benny Eggs, Mangano, Quiet Dom, Baldy Dom. You know, he's got to branch out to other people, and that's where they get you. Well, I look at Vinny Bastiano and and – I don't, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. Dom Tricali and I have had some, I guess some, I've never said anything to him. He's got issues with me, whatever. But uh, I look at it like, to me, that's a perfect example. I mean, Vinny Basciano didn't know Dom Tricali before 1999, 2000. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in 2002, he's, you know, making the guy a, a capo. And by 2004, when he's getting locked up, he's putting him, uh, you know, on the ruling panel. He, he knew the guy for less than five years. So when he he flips and gives Vinny up, and now Vinny's, you know, he's got an appeal that uh, could possibly get some traction. But most likely, Vinny ain't ever going to see the light of day before. And he, and to me, he owes it to the fact that he trusted a guy he shouldn't have trusted. Yeah, well, we're stuck in the life when you're stuck in there. You know, the, you know the old saying, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So yep. when I was away... I had one guy go into the witness protection program. I had other guys given dry, you know, dry snitch and given information that we knew who they were. You know, you read your indictment. Me and my co-defendants are sitting around a table. We read the indictment. We know on which count all of us are here and there's somebody missing. Obviously, we figure out who the snitch is, right? right. So, there, But we really had one major snitch. The guy went to the program. But whatever the case is, 
you know you you know the people you're around. But once you got to branch out, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. And when I was in jail and I realized that you could never beat the snitches, this life is worthless. Because I said, no matter what, you got to put yourself out there and deal with too many people. I don't care how insulated you think you are. There's, and nowadays you could do hearsay. You could do somebody over, you know, somebody gets overheard. You're in a, you're in a cafe with me and you and I are bullshitting. And we say, uh, uh, let's go back. Chin's dead. Let's use him. We go like this, you know, this guy over here, I'm on surveillance going this guy. And you say, yeah, yeah, Chin, you know, and then they use that tape against Chin. How could he stop that? You can't run around. You know, I say, I understand he put a death penalty out on anybody who mentioned his name on tape, but you still can't stop people from talking. You know, you still can't, it's impossible. So I said, you know what? This, first of all, there's other reasons why I left the, left the life. I felt like it was beneath me, that whole, it was a snake pit. When I realized all these guys were dying for nothing but money, a lot of guys that died, that broke, that that destroyed me. I felt like, you know what? If you told me a guy went against Omerta, we believe in this, La Cosa Nostra, we understand the rules, we understand the laws. I, I'm, I'm raised in this now since I'm hijacking trucks at 17. I wasn't born into it, but since I'm 17, Right. I understand this life. I'm around people that are, are in the life. And then, you know, now, you know, you, you you go away and you realize that when you were away, rather, guys died, guys got killed, guys disappeared. You never asked questions. Now you're away. And I realized everybody's indi indictments are laid bare. Everybody's bullshitting about the guys that they gene charged with killing. And I'm realizing this guy died for his company. This guy died for. 250,000 that he owed somebody or was owed. This guy died. For, and I'm going, they're all dying for money. I understood it. You don't kill people for a trillion dollars. I knew you could give Ronnie, my childhood friend, you could give Ronnie a trillion dollars and tell him to kill me. I knew he wouldn't kill me. I knew he wouldn't kill me because he wouldn't kill for money. Ronnie's well, not. Isn't, isn't that though, though kind of uh, another thing that sometimes gets lost in translation uh, to the civilians that are, either following or mm -hmm. looking at the mob that they sometimes people that aren't there think that, you know, hits are given out. Uh, you know, people are getting money for hits. Like, you do the hit because your boss told you to do the hit. There's, there's no, no money there's involved. No money involved in it. There's no money. If you ever, right. nobody pays you for a hit. Nobody. Right. You, you, yeah. And you can't, you can't, I think you get clipped if you go around taking money from people right. to hit because who's paying you to do a hit. They're going to give you up at some point or another. You know, I had a guy one time approach me, a legitimate guy, and somebody beat him. He was a legitimate guy. I was kind of like doing a soft shake with him back then when I was a different person. And he approached me and he had a beef with somebody and the guy beat him out of a lot of money. And he goes, I want the guy clipped. And he, and he goes, whatever it costs me. And I said, are you out of your mind? I said, let, me say, let, me, let me explain something to you, I said. Just so you know, let's say I was stupid enough to tell you, okay, it's not ketchup. That's going to be all over this guy. It's going to be blood and guts all over the place for the little bit of money. And I said little bit. It was a lot of money. But for the little bit of money that you're owed, that you can't sleep about, go on and make more money. Don't start killing people. And this is me. I'm the mob guy. Mm -hmm. Telling a legitimate guy you're out of your mind. Now, does that happen all the time? Go turn on the TV. TV watch ID Discovery. Yeah. You know episodes Watch Dale on NBC. They're telling, they're showing you an episode every every week. Showing every you week that these people think they can they can hire a hitman and somehow yeah, they'll uh, kill his wife, get away with it. Kill the wife to kill the husband. They're out of their yeah. minds. So here's a guy where I put the guy in place. He's a legitimate guy. I told him you're a legitimate guy. You're in over your head. Your thoughts. Your thoughts are getting above your head. So you know, P.S. I was the guy who saved somebody's life that day. You know, maybe if he would have approached a knucklehead who said, hell yeah, how much? Give me 50 grand. I'll kill him. You know, you, you got a body laying in the street and you got a family crying and, you know, you got daughters going, where's daddy, you know, for the rest of their lives. You know, so I would never, never entertain even that crap. And when I was away, I saw all that shit around me and I go, wow, I was in a snake pit. And these guys are all cowards too. Let me tell you that put a bullet in the back of your head when you're not looking, you know, that that's cowardly and to steal something from you. That's all cowardly stuff to me. You know, I mean, I, I feel like Omerta is being a man. That's what the original meaning of Omerta was back in Sicily. Omerta was being a man in every way. Meaning if you got a problem, you take care of it yourself. If you got to face somebody, you face off with the guy, you stand up to the guy yourself. You don't go, you know, that's to me, it's like almost like, uh, it's not only treacherous, but it's, and snaky, but it's like, um, it's almost like, uh, 
Weasley, you know, like you may as well just go poison people like the Roman emperors or something, you know, the, the, the wives of the Roman emperors or something, you know, you, you gotta face, you gotta, you gotta face the guy when you got to beef with the guy, you know, this whole, well, I'm going to sneak up and put a bolt in the back of his head. And tomorrow I'm going to take over his trucking company. Then I'm going to take over the nightclub. Then I'm going to, then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to, this would ruin the mob too. I so, love your, I love the historical, uh, little tidbit name drops that you've thrown in there. And I think it, I want to use this as kind of a segue. You know, you mentioned Joseph Stalin. You're talking about the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how I I, uh, mm-hmm. I kind of opened this episode saying that Dean went from like Robert De Niro in Heat and mm-hmm. now he's like Russell Crowe in The Beautiful Mind. <laughs> that, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, gone from uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, tough I, guy to intellectual. But talk about that. that tr- yeah, uh, I should. T- I should. Thank that you. Evolution and becoming an out. author and writing. Yeah. Your- so I'm in prison and um, I'm, you know, I'm in there playing pinochle every day, you know, spades, the typical stuff and uh, just wasting the day. You want to kill the day. I'm fighting my cases. And at some point I said, I want to, I want to educate myself. If I'm here, even if I got to die in this place, I want to be smarter than I, than I am. I want to be smarter tomorrow than I was yesterday. And I want to start to learn things. There's a big world out there. And I asked my friend, fat George DeBello, who passed away towards the end of last year. Beautiful guy. Loved him. Again, my friend for 35 years. He was the caretaker of John Gotti's social club, Fat George DeBello. And I used to see Fat George by the club all the time. And he had tattoos from head to toe. There's pictures of me. If somebody searches, I think there's a couple of pictures of me floating around online with Fat George. Where One of them, I think he's got his shirt off. You could see how many tattoos he had. But I called up Fat George. And I remember when we'd be playing cards in the summer and he had his shirt off, he would have a verse here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He even had something for John Gotti. You know, he knows John. He knew John Gotti, just to give you an idea of George's view of the world. It's a shame he's gone. George knew John Gotti before the world knew John Gotti. John Gotti was just an average uh, acting skipper in Ozone Park, Queens, when George knew him. Or a soldier, even before that. And, you know, or even he probably knew him as a kid, even before he got straightened out, John. And then he became John Gotti, the boss of the Gambino family. The, you know, the papers called him the boss of bosses, which you know he wasn't, but the boss of bosses tag and stuff. So George was there for the whole thing. So anyway, I called George from jail. He used to visit me all the time in jail. And he actually got caught on a visit one day. I talk about it in my memoir. He brought me up, uh, he, he brought me up Prejut and Mortadelle, all rolled up in a little bag. And then he went to the, the vending machine and he stuffed the Italian cold cuts in the bag and then handed me the bag. And they caught him on camera. So I says, oh, son of a bitch. And I knew I, <laughs> they threw him off the visit. So I was able to talk to the, the, the head of the guards. And I go, do me a favor. I says, he was just looking out for me. It's food. I go, go check, go check the bag. There's no drugs in there. No, nothing like that. It's food. Don't take him off forever. And they go, no, we know. We're watching the guy for years. He's, he's, he's a good guy. We talked to him on the way in and stuff. And he was. So they let him continue on my, on my visitors list. By the way, the guards weren't bad. All bad. All of them. There's now and then you get a hack who's a jerk. But for the most part, these guys just, and women, they just want to do their job. They go in there morning, noon, and night. They work hard. Don't give them problems. They don't give you problems for the most part. I just want to tip my hat to the prison guards that I was around that I liked. A lot of times when I was in the state joint, after I did fed time, I went to the state for a couple of years. When I was in the state joint, they used to, used to get 55 pounds of food. And Ronnie used to send me my food packages, actually. So I used to get 55 pounds of food. If Ronnie put in 75, 80 pounds, these guys knew I wasn't causing no problems. They knew I kept to myself. I stayed. I sat by my window with a book all day. They'd give me a wink and go, hurry up, get it out of here. And don't make it look too heavy on your way back to your housing block. You know, because, you know, and I'd be dragging the bag, you know. But, um, but anyway, going back to, I'm in jail. I called Fat George. I said, do me a favor. You got biblical verses all over your body. and and he had b- verses why I was telling you about how he knew John from when he was a kid. He had biblical verses dedicated don't, uh, that he wrote for John. Like, in other words, when John got convicted, he wrote a biblical verse for John. When he got convicted, he felt like he lost a father. And he was actually raised in Richie's house, bald Richie, who you said. Richie yeah, Richie got it, yeah. Yeah, he basically raised George. So I called George. I says, George, do me a favor. Send me in some books. He goes, what do you want? Big asses, big boobs? What are you into? Mm-hmm. I go, no, 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 no. Books I could read. And he went to the bookstore. He sent me in my first books. I began reading. I fell in love with books. Scott, when I tell you, I used to look up at the cinder block ceiling and say, I don't know how this worked, but I'm being punished for things I did. And I know that. But at the same time, I'm being rewarded because I found books. I found something, you know, we, we rewarded for 
trying to better myself. In other words, you got to take your punishment. You got to take your lumps. We used to have a saying, if you inform, you never have an opportunity to reform. So I didn't inform. I'm going to be here for years. And what am I going to do with the time? I found books and I read, eventually I was reading in the beginning. I didn't, I couldn't even get to a page without having to look up words. I bought a dictionary, you know, for a few stamps or a stamp. And I've started looking up words and stuff and studying them at night before you know it, I'm reading 18 hours a day and you know, lights on lights off. I read between those two, you know, lock in, you know, right to the last minute, every day I'd fall, book, fall asleep with the book on my chest. And at some point I learned, I learned history. I learned literature. I learned science. I learned religion, everything you could think of philosophy from the ancient philosophers, the Greek and Romans up until the enlightenment philosophers, philosophers, the Renaissance, et cetera, up until present day, 20th century philosophers. Um, so I don't know, I don't know who stands out in the 21st century, but I go up until the 20th and, uh, And that's what changed my life. And I said, I'm going to be a writer when I go home. I remember I went to my last team meeting and I was in bad joints because they wanted to punish me for not snitching. They sent me to Lewisburg Penitentiary. My first day in the pen, double homicide, Aryan Brotherhood hacks to death and guts two black Muslims. Welcome to the penitentiary. I'm smack in the middle of a race war. So, I mean, you want to talk about like wild, like you can't imagine, um, there was a guy I got close with there. I want to tip my hat, Richie Lawler, a man of men, true man, 100,000% man of men. Uh, talk about, you know, live by Omerta, you know, even, even though, you know, he, was, he wasn't, you know, heavily involved with the mob, he lived by Omerta. You know, he was with, around mobsters his whole life, but he was a true man. So I was with Richie in, in the pen and he explained to me the backstory of before I got there and how the murders were going back and forth. And it continued after I left at some point. But um, but anyway, I'm in the pen. I continued to read. And I remember when I left the pen, they go, what are you going to do with yourself? No, I'm sorry. When I left my team meeting before I went over to the state, they go, what are you going to do with yourself when I get out? I go, I'm going to be an international best-selling author. They were hysterical at the table. They all cracked up. They go, that's the best one we heard yet. So I go, no, no, I ain't bullshitting. I'm not shitting you, I said. That's what I'm going to do. And I did. That's exactly what I did. You know, by then I gave you, you give yourself the education. You have the confidence from the education that you give yourself. There's nothing you can't do in this world. All these books behind me, I read. I pull a book off the shelf every day. I re- I'm still got my nose in a book every day. I love reading. And that all went into my new life. And I left that behind. And I said to the guys, I was there, as I said before, look, I'm never going to rat. If I got to leave here in a pine box, so be it. But if I ever get out of here, I just want to go my own way and be left alone. And everybody I was with has respected that. There might be young mobsters who come up now who never knew me. Oh, who is this guy? I never heard of him. Oh, who's that guy? Oh, it's just like rat. And he's talking about the guys who knew me, the real guys, the real guys who knew me and lived with me. They know what I'm made of. And those are the guys I was able to see towards the end of last year who gave me big hugs and kisses when I saw them. Louis, uh, let everyone know, uh, first of all, how many books have you, have you written? I wrote a, so I wrote a memoir called Unlock, right. The Life right. and Crimes of a Mafia Insider. That goes, all the crimes I talk about in that book, just so you know, I was either investigated for or charged with. I wanted to make sure that of the million crimes I did, I wanted to just hone in on things that if anybody goes, oh, come on, this ain't true. Yeah. You could look them up. They're all true. Everything I talked about, even where I went in prisons, it's all true. Everything could be documented. That's the first book. The second book was... Uh, Mob rules: What the mafia can teach legitimate business. Yeah, we yeah. we might. Uh, Lou, I might bring you back on, and we might I'd do a whole. If you're good, I'd yep. love to do maybe a whole episode on that. I'd I was love to come back. I was looking at that earlier uh, this week, mm-hmm. and I was like, "This is something that I think is so um, Scott twenty something lines. that people don't think about, but there are a ton of applicable mm-hmm. uh, philosophies and and and." strategies that that are universal that go across God, if, both. You, if you strip away the violence and you just use the savviness of mobsters and how they do business every day that's what you have in this book yep. take away the violence those are the lessons you can learn so that that was the second book in 20 languages the third book was believe it or not i developed a theory when i was in jail about how the dreaming brain can see nanoseconds into the future and i recorded all my dreams while i was in jail in my cell and uh that book is called the three pound crystal ball the brain weighs three pounds. Yeah, right. Crystal ball obviously could see into the future. Uh, the three pound crystal ball, the theory of sleep aid, and the unconscious mind's exclusive access into the corridors of time. That's about the dreaming brain. A lot of us have had dreams where we see the future. You know, in, sometimes it's a day away, 
My, I just talk about the few seconds in the future because I wanted to keep it grounded in science and scientific thought. So it's all grounded in physics, psychology. I didn't want to just do a completely paranormal book where people go, I don't want to hear that. That's just paranormal stuff. And I do believe in the paranormal world. Obviously, there are things we can't explain that happen to us. We just haven't had the scientific evidence yet to, to, to define how these things are working. But this book goes deep into science to try to explain exactly what's going on inside the brain. So it's it's grounded in neuroscience. Then I wrote the Borgata Trilogy. Volume one is out now. I urge all of your listeners to go buy it. It's Borgata, uh, The Rise, uh, Rise of Empire is volume one, A History of the American Mafia. It begins in Sicily and it follows. It's a little deep in the beginning, a little academic, but then we get into the gory guts of storytelling. You know, the, the gore and the guts and the blood and stuff of just the intrigues and all that other stuff. The fun stuff comes after I just lay out the foundations of the mafia and how, how it uh, came about in Sicily. You know, Lou, for me, honestly, everyone kind of thinks that, um, you know, it's the blood and guts that, that grabs me. And honestly, not to say that murders aren't an important part of the history of this and the, the study of this, but for me, my passion my what drives me to study this stuff is the politics mm, I get now the, the, the the murders are sometimes results of right. the politics but how mm. power flows in a family exactly uh, what I how do. the political machinations that's mm. what's always fascinating I'm the me. same as you I'm the same as you Scott that's what intrigues me you know I want to know I want to know all the politics behind when it's, you know, when you talk about Vito Genovese had Frank Costello shot by Chin Gigante. Right. Okay, great. Anybody could read about that. I want to go deep into what, what Genovese, what, what, yeah, what the he steps was that led up to that. The steps that led up to it. And also to the brain of Vito Genovese, how he was sort of planning this all along and how he was laying seeds and how he planted different seeds. And I get deep into that. The other thing I do is I debunk a lot of mafia myths that we believed for the last 40, 50 years. And I don't just tell you, look, a bell goes off when I'm reading. If I'm doing my research and something's not true, I know right away it's not true. Albert Anastasia pushed a little, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, a stroller. He pushed a stroller with a baby in it to, to kind of like get a, a, a handle on Dewey's, Thomas Dewey's uh, movements. And Albert Anastasia was a boss. You think he's going to sit yeah. and put a baby <laughs> no. stroller? I mean, who told me this shit up? Give me a break. So when a bell goes off like that, I go deep into where the story might have came from, why we keep repeating it, because obviously people repeat the, you know, the last sauce and the last sauce and the last sauce. But where it came from, I go back and then I explain to the reader why this could have never been. And I, I, I don't want the reader to just believe me. Don't, don't, don't have trust in me. Let me prove to you why you should have trust in me. And I give you the steps as to why these things could never have happened. And this is probably what really did happen. And people have enjoyed that part of the book so far immensely because I break down things that a lot of us heard and repeat and hear on documentaries and in books. And it's not true. Yeah. You it's know, not true. Here in Detroit, I mean, that will kind of maybe end on this and then maybe hopefully set the table for a return. Now, this has been, this literally has been one of my favorite conversations, interviews I've done mm -hmm. in our uh, four years plus of doing this. So Lou, thank you so much. Thank you. But, Piggybacking off what you just said, I think, and I want to get your insight on it too, but a big part of my brand is the Jimmy Hoffa mystery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many fallacies mm -hmm. and the, the, the narrative that's accepted, especially after mm -hmm. uh, the, the De Niro Scorsese uh, Pacino Pesci movie, the Irishman. Mm -hmm. um, there are some like just, unadulterated falsehoods mm -hmm. that have made it into this narrative that it's beyond just civilians mm -hmm. or people. I'm talking about people that are supposed to be experts mm -hmm. on this stuff. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. that are supposed to be historians, people mm -hmm. that are supposed to be reporters doing their due diligence. Mm -hmm. They continue now almost 50 years later mm -hmm. on this, you know, a blatant fallacy that mm -hmm. the Hoffa murder contract or the Hoffa, the green light was somehow, uh, you know, the whole thing was this East Coast operation that was being run. Detroit was some, you know, uh, side uh, sideline player mm -hmm. and that the, the East Coast mob bosses were puppeteering the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the Detroit guys were just basically 
uh, pawns mm-hmm. to be moved. It's like, no, dude, the Detroit handled this thing from top to bottom. Detroit mm-hmm. was a family that had a seat on the commission. Mm-hmm. These guys were as, mm-hmm. uh, you know, savvy, mm-hmm. smart, and lethal as any crime family in the entire country. Mm-hmm. The reason they haven't found Jimmy Hoffa's body is because Detroit did such an amazing job. Mm -hmm. The reason nobody's ever been arrested Mm -hmm. is because they did such an amazing job. And this Mm -hmm. continual belief from the overall media, specifically Mm -hmm. in East Coast media, Mm -hmm. this bias that it had to have come from Mm -hmm. uh, Tony Provenzano in New Jersey. It had to have come from... Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there wasn't over. I'm not saying there wasn't coordination. There was this mm-hmm. type of murder mm-hmm. had to have a lot of different bosses sign mm-hmm. off on it. Mm-hmm. But the idea that I'm going to uh, I'm taking not... bodies across uh, yep. the country is just absolutely no. ludicrous and offensive, frankly, to the mm-hmm. Detroit guys. Well, I will tell you this: with the last thing you said, I don't want to give too much up because I get heavily into the Hoffa murder and and his whole life and the Teamsters. In, in volume two, I urge you, I urge your listeners to read volume one of Borgata, the Borgata trilogy, so that you're ready for volume two when I get deep into the half of murder and the half of life, half his life. By the way, I came away with a, I came away. Sometimes you come away from reading about somebody with a dislike or a likeness for the person. I liked Hoffa tremendously as a person. I liked him. I know he made a lot of mistakes towards the end. I wouldn't have agreed with the things he did towards the end. But up until the end, when he came home from prison, he was a little bit of a different person. Up until that moment, Hoffa was a likable guy, and he loved yep. his teamsters. Uh, he, had, not- he had literally tens of millions of people around the world that hung on his every word that would have yeah. done anything for him. Man. He was a leader of – he was almost like a de facto head of state in some way. He was way. a man's man too. Uh, but not to get too deep into it, but I will say I urge your, your listeners to read it. Uh, I get into the Hoffa thing. I wanted to, I, you know, obviously you said, like you said, his body, come on, you're going to do a hit that the holes pre dug before you get rid of, before you even clip somebody yeah. that, you know, exactly where you're bringing them. You think somebody's going to throw somebody in a trunk and drive 12, 800 miles to 1800 miles, 2,500 miles with a body. Because Tony need- Provenzano wanted a trophy. In the, I'll, I'll finish by saying that Tony, and I could go on this. Tony Provenzano is the most overrated character in the Hoffa saga well, by far. Well, he dude, played dude, almost no role in it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't wait for you to read my take on the whole thing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I'm in agreement with you. Um, but I went deep. I went very deep. Great. I think deeper than anybody's ever gone. And once again, too, I used that bell in the back of my head. If it rang, I knew something was bullshit. You know, I don't want to hear he's in Giant Stadium. He's in the Veronzano Bridge. He's in. You're not carrying. There's a body. no body. I'm gonna. Just, I'll, give, I'll give you the uh, yeah. skip to or um, cut to the chase. There is no body. His body was incinerated within about a half hour of him being murdered. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we're sitting here 50 years later, running around with. God, like, I'm with you on that. Street. By the way, 100. Yeah. percent That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened, Scott. Yeah. Yep. So- so Scott, I, I love being on your show. Anytime you want me back, let's do maybe maybe we'll do Borgata Volume Two when Please. the Hoffa stuff comes out, and uh, we could do Mob Rules too if you want. I'll talk was, more about it. This was awesome, Louis. Let's just as we finish, let everyone know where they can find you in terms of like yeah, social. Thanks. And- yeah, appreciate it. My website, LouisFerrante.com, L-O-U-I-S-F-E-R-R-A-N-T-E.com. Uh, there are links there where you could buy my books. There's um, that's pretty much there's a lot of information about me on there. Um, so that's the best place you can go to Amazon to buy the book or anywhere else, Barnes and Noble, uh, buy any of my old books, my new book. Um, but louisferrante.com, probably the best place where you could find everything from there. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate Perfect. it. Perfect. Thank you, Lou. Uh, this was an amazing interview. I hope the audience liked it. Please like subscribe, share, uh, on your socials, OG uh, pod. We'll keep giving you the great inside knowledge on true crime across the globe. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Thank you, Benny Behind the Glass. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out.